Welcome to the second part of my .NET Aspire um, maybe series. Let's see. Um, so last time I did a little mistake, just uh, put things first and the Microsoft guy just uh, kindly informed me that um, it is not true that the service discovery um, NuGet package was available before Aspire. So if you watch the other video, the first part, uh, be aware that uh, there is a little correction. This package came, um, in fact, with Aspire. So with this out of the way, um, let's talk about today. So what I want to do today is to um, redo the initial setup of an Aspire application. And then I want to concentrate on the Azure part of things. So I'm not going to do this series because I'm uh, trying to make details or talk about details uh, in the .NET uh, thing. We will touch this here and there, but uh, this series um, of videos is about uh, my opinion on the AZD part, so the Azure Developer CAI, which enables you to run um, your Aspire application as it is in the cloud. So today I'm going to start to show you how it works um, and the next uh, video uh, will be about uh, some deeper look into what gets uh, deployed and why I consider it uh, to be a bad idea in enterprise environments or in professional environments not saying that it's not working the opposite is true it's working like a charm and Microsoft did a great job on that I think on automating this um, but uh, the result um, is not something you should run in production that's my opinion and let's see if I can prove it today and with the further videos. So if you're interested in that, let's go ahead. I will share my screen. So um, let's start by the .NET new um, and doing the command again to name my project Aspire Demo and it will create, uh, as you've seen last time, the structure. So um, let's look at this. This is the structure. Let's open this in Visual Studio and have a look uh, if it's working or not and talk about some stuff again. So if you run this and wait a little bit, let me have a coffee here. Mm -hmm. So it's building. coming up so it's running the app host project and now it should open the browser with which was not working last time by the way but now it works so here we have um, two things running an API and a web front end and if I uh, visit the uh, front end you can see here that the calls are working so this especially is a cached version of calling the API from the UI so it works okay um, let's stop it and let's have uh, a little bit of a look to understand what's going on um, so again this is the starting point of the whole application this program class here and as you can see we are configuring an API by adding it to the builder the project here to the builder and name it with this string and then add a second project which is a UI called web frontend which is exposed outside and which uh, has a reference to the first project so that way we know that this project needs to be able to call endpoints on the first project so uh, as I said with that let's uh, stop here for a moment um, and let's open the folder in VS Code because now I'm going to go over here. You can see it go over to deploy this to Azure. So um, let's have a look in my Azure subscription where I'm going to deploy it to. This is the subscription. It's filtered here on that subscription. So it's showing the resource groups. You can see there is one resource group. This resource group by default in um, this, the tenants of uh, which, which we handle or we support uh, have certain resources deployed like key vaults and stuff every subscription has this management resource group which is kind of the base setup of it meaning for you you can ignore the management group here the resource group this is just there for um, cloud adoption framework reasons 
this subscription basically from your perspective is considered empty. Okay, cool. So with that, um, let's hop over here and talk about AZD. So AZD is something you need to install. If you type AZD, just like that, you see this is the Azure Developer CLI. It has different um, uh, commands, subcommands, a lot of stuff. Uh, the stuff here is better currently. But what you uh, should do in the first step, if you clone the project locally or if you do it the first time, you enter AZD in it. Um, and this gives uh, you a question and he asks, is this in the current directory, the project you want to AZD in it? We say yes. And if you have uh, the recent version of AZD installed, it will detect that this is an Aspire application and it will tell you that. Let's see. So here we go. Um, he detected Aspire, as you can see here. Um, he sees the Apple's project and he will generate the files necessary. Confirm that, hit enter. And now he wants to um, us to define an environment name. So what is an environment? An environment here is uh, meant to be um, uh, like a stage in Azure or in the cloud later. So usually you're thinking about stages like test and production. Um, this is not just a name. This is a really an important thing. It needs to be um, um, conform to the technology you use or the process you use. So for instance, if you have a test and a production stage, you would deploy to test first, try it out, and if it runs, you deploy this to production so that your customers can see it then. This is what an environment is. So we start with test, and that's it. He's done for the initialization. Let's have a look at what happened. So what you get is a markdown file which explains what to do next. Let's hop over that. Then you have a YAML file, which uh, is nicely supported by a, a schema, meaning that if you hover over certain things, you see, you see uh, possible options here. So for instance, as a hosting scenario, you can stick to the container app default, but you also can do Azure App Services, for instance, if you want to, and then the later the deployment will adhere whatever to whatever you defined here. Um, and he says the language is .NET. Other languages available, as you can see, are JS, TypeScript, Java, Python. And uh, yeah, so this is uh, the first starting point. So this is configuring the app. This is what you would uh, add to your source control as well. At least I, um, I think so, yeah. But this is taking, this git ignore is now taking .azure out of the source control. So this folder is not meant to be checked in. Be aware of that. And it's also supported by having an additional git ignore here in that folder which was generated, which is ignoring basically anything in it. So what you have here is you have um, for every stage or every environment, this is the test one I defined, you have an .env file, which tells him kind of, this is the syntax where you can tell, let me zoom a little bit, that this is about environment variables, which will be set um, during the .env um, thing. So right away, I will add some stuff. So first of all, if now I follow the instructions, which is in next steps, it's telling me that at some point in time, I am, um, I should do AZD up or a combination of AZD provision and AZD deploy. Um, I'm not going to do that right away because when I execute AZD up, it will start an assistant because it recognizes, wait a second, uh, there are missing environment variables. So I, because I know that, I will show you how to do that. So the first thing you need to define is the location or region um, in Azure where you want to deploy to. So in my case, it's West Europe. Um, so you define the Azure location environment variable to set to West Europe. The next thing I'm going to switch on, although it's not working correctly, is the so-called demo mode of AZD. Um, it is documented as if you switch it to true, um, uh, at least that's what the documentation says, uh, it should disable spitting out um, some values like the subscription ID because this is not working and you would see the subscription ID anyways. I'm now adding my subscription ID, the Azure subscription ID, which is this one, 
to the environment. So he's not going to ask me about location and subscription. Uh, be aware that this file over time gets populated. When we run the azd command, we will watch here again. So with that in place, now you think you can do azd up, but um, you can try, but uh, you shouldn't be able to do it. So why is that? When I run azd up uh, now in that folder, it should try to deploy the resources to Azure. But in order to be able to do that, uh, it should be clear that it needs to have credentials. Um, so usually you would say the easy way, like Microsoft shows it, is that the user you're logged in with in this shell is the user who is performing this operation, which is a bad idea. So if you never heard about that, you should not run around and be such a high privileged user using your shell uh, or the browser that you can change, deploy, whatever, something in Azure. You could be a reader in Azure, but you should not run around being um, a contributor or an owner of resources. So instead, what you should do, you should have service principles defined, which are like app registrations, if you will, in Azure. And if you want to know more about that, uh, please write in the commands, because it's not um, the, the focus of this talk to do that. I prepared three variables in my PowerShell session, which is tenant ID, client ID, and secret. So those um, variables are populated. And I will do the azd off command and try to log in to this tenant with this user and password, which is not a real user. It's not a human being. It is a technical user, if you will. So. Um, in simple words, a user which does not have a mail address. So now I locked into, I locked AZD, the tooling, into Azure using this client ID, client secret. And with that, I should be able to perform the command AZD up. So this command, let's see what happens. So I'm doing AZD up. So what it's doing is it is analyzing my application again and seeing what do I need. And um, then he uh, basically he corrected my AZD output. And now you can see that AZD demo mode is set to true, but still it's spilling out my subscription ID. So that's why I showed it to you. And now the deployment is happening. So we can see that in the Azure portal. Let me go over and refresh and refresh again. And now you can see there is this RG test. So this is my environment name. And this resource group got created. If you click on that, you can see that there's already resources deployed and there's a deploy operation running. This is what you can expect from Bicep. Those are my resources getting deployed. And you can watch the details and see what he's doing. So currently, he's in the phase of deploying the Azure Container App environment because I selected to um, use container apps. So for that, he needs an environment. In order to have all the role-based access control right, he is um, uh, using managed identities. All of that is part of the bicep scripts, which again, is really nicely done. Um, so to make this work like this works right now, it's a hard, hard uh, thing to do, believe me. I tried uh, and we are still trying at my company to automate like this. This is really nice, um, nice experience. But uh, with that, let's go over and look at the resource group here and look at my uh, running job. I will pause the video for a moment while this is running. It takes like two, three, maybe five minutes, depending on how often you did it. And then let's look at the result. So, um, it is done, it is performed, so it deployed everything it needed. Let's look in the Azure portal now for the final results. So here you have Azure Container Apps for the web frontend and the API service. You have the Container App environment, Container Registry, so things get uh, pushed to that registry. Let's have a look if we have images inside of it. Um, let's see, uh, settings, uh, repositories, here it is. So as you can see, he already pushed uh, images for my API and my web front end to that repository. So that's how he is able to run those container apps here with those images. 
and uh, we have a log analytics workspace which kind of is if you ask me is a little bit of questionable we will talk about that in the next video when we uh, look into the azure resources which got deployed so but the interesting part is that he even um, outputs the uh, endpoints at which uh, stuff is running so first of all there is an aspire dashboard now running in the cloud let's hop over to that let's uh, open that in the browser so he's logging me in and he says i'm not authenticated which is kind of logical because i deployed with my service principle and um, i think i never tested this but i think now i have to authenticate my user in azure uh, which is now my real user um, to be able to access this and i didn't do that so the good news is uh, you cannot just access the aspire dashboard um, although it is publicly available as an endpoint it's not accessible just like that but what is accessible is this thing so i can see now my app running on a randomly generated domain and it is let me f12 to see the network tab here so when you now hit the weather uh, endpoint what you can see is it's populating the data and this data is coming through this request going to um, uh, this uh, URL. So this is going to its own weather endpoint, but you know, um, uh, it's the get request and the response. Uh, it's, it's not the request, if I'm looking correctly, because this is going to the web front end, which is interesting. I expected it to be um, the request going to the api you don't see the api request which is nice um it's just looking as if it's coming from the web front end itself interesting um so i was just hitting my weather you don't see the request going to the api uh here which is kind of surprising me right now i was expecting that this is a get request um going to so when i do this one uh, the fetch and XHR, it is a fetch, but interestingly enough, it is hidden by Blazor that it's going to the API, but this data is coming from the API right now. So that's nice. Uh, it's working and it's running in the cloud. Cool. So with this, let's do something else. Let's now uh, imagine, uh, let me go over to Visual Studio, that now you got deployed this, maybe you deployed that uh, in uh, several times to update the UI or whatever. So maybe we do that. Um, let's go over and change whatever uh, uh, something on the page to see how fast an update is. So let's go to the home page and let's just remove this. Um, let's say maybe not all of this, maybe this, and let's call this Aspire uh, demo. And this is Aspire as a page title. So now I changed something. And uh, now let's execute AZD up again. Let's see what happens. So in theory, uh, what I expect him to do is to generate a new image. So to build a new Docker image, because now we changed something, push it. And uh, here it is, pushing container image. Uh, for the API service and then pushing probably the image for the web front end and then it should be updated in the web. So while this is running, just to make sure this is not the way you should do it from your machine, what you should do is prepare everything on, um, on your machine, uh, commit this to a repository and then run whatever automation in your repo in your um, code tooling like in github actions or in azure devops pipelines this should run there which by the way also is marked in the readme if you look here the next steps tell you that you should configure in cicd pipeline it gives you hints how to do that and uh, that is what you should do okay so while this is running also what you can see here the first deployment created the environment variables so that he knows where he deployed to the last time from this machine of course so here you can see he uh, added a managed client 
he added this uh, mesh 9 identity name. So all of this got added by the azd up command in the env, um, so where you wanted to deploy it. That's interesting. And now he's done. And when we go to the web front end, it should say Aspire demo now, and it has Aspire as the page title. So it works, and um, it's a nice experience, uh, especially for people who want to have quick results. And again, um, I'm a little bit critical about that, but still, it works. So you have to admit that this is uh, nicely done. So now let's do something else. So for the moment, we have deployed like these resources, uh, but what happens if, let's say, the API needs access to a storage account, so a, a Azure storage account, and uh, needs to pass information to the web frontend for the storage account. So how do you do that? Because this is a natural thing. Over time, you say, oh, now I need a database. Now I need a storage account. How is that working? Okay, let's do code first. And let's try it out here. So let's start with the API service itself. So that is what needs to have a connection. So what I'm doing is I will add a NuGet package here. And this is kind of a little bit new. Normally, what you would do is you would manually install all the dependencies for accessing storage account here. So what I'm uh, now doing is um, that I am adding a special NuGet package, which uh, comes with Aspire, uh, which is called Aspire Azure Storage Blobs. So if you click here, what you will see is there is a ton of dependencies, which um, also have dependencies, there, which are coming with this package. And watch what happens. If you install this, you agree to install all of those uh, dependencies, and you have to accept this. And now what happens is this gets for the moment of the recording, this gets yellow because of a simple fact that one of the dependencies, uh, so one of the transitive packages, this one, Azure Identity, currently has a vulnerability detected. So um, don't get scared of this. You should get scared, of course, but you know, this is currently normal because a lot of uh, security issues uh, get detected and now Visual Studio and other tools will tell you that uh, this needs to be updated. But currently, uh, there is probably no new version. All of those versions are vulnerable. Oh, in fact, there is a new one. So let's handle this and let's see if this works. If we install the 11.4, so we update to a higher version on that package and hopefully we get rid of the warning. So now, I explicitly installed the newer version of Azure Identity. It should be downward compatible because it didn't change the first uh, version number. So now this package needs this package, but it gets it now explicitly in the new version. Be aware that this has nothing to do with Aspire. This is just because packages tend to bring in packages and those transitive uh, warnings occurring, you need to tackle them. Okay, but now we have this in place. And what we can do here in the program, let's say after we added the service defaults, what we can do is we can simply use the builder now to add uh, the ability, let's say, to access blob clients here. And we just name this connection to Azure Blob storage. Remember there's Azure Blob storage, Azure Table storage, Queue storage, and File storage. And we are only caring about blob storage. So we adding like Azure blob client to the um, dependency injection, naming it blob connection. So this string is important later. Okay, cool. And what I, so now it's pretty hard for the UI to get some information about that. That is why I will add another endpoint here. Uh, so map as the get endpoint and let's say it it will be something called info and what i'm doing is i'm now writing formally known the controller method and what i'm doing is um, var uh, client equals um, app services get required service which is really bad what i'm doing here because the di is now i'm using app in app so that's not the best approach don't do it that way. It's just for um, 
uh, for the sake of um, a demo. Get required, give me the blob client and return a new thing, an anonymous type. Let's make it a complex type, which is uh, called storage account name equals client account name. So what I'm doing here is I'm just returning a new anonymous object where this, this is going to be JSON, which tells you, well, this is a storage account name and um, the value will be the account name of the injected uh, blob client. So that way we have something exposed on an API endpoint, which gives us some information. Okay, cool. Step one. Now, step two is that we need to go to the app host and tell the app host that this API needs something in Azure in order to run because now this thing needs a storage account in Azure and also locally. So what we're going to do, we need another NuGet package, but this time in this project, we are adding a NuGet package, which is called Aspire hosting Azure storage. This is this one because we are now in the app host. We are not trying to access the Azure storage itself in the app host. We are trying to configure it. That's why we use Aspire hosting. Okay. Install that. By the way, the same issue applies probably to this one, right? We have again, if we undo the filter, we have again this issue, but now we know that we need to update to a newer version install. So what needs to happen, by the way, is uh, that the Aspire team needs to uh, create an update for all their packages using uh, identity. And uh, that way they, for the next version, they will with this package uh, deliver the 11.4. Okay, nice. So after we added this NuGet package, what we now can do is we can say, well, listen, Aspire, before we configure this, the first thing we need is we need to have access to uh, storage, uh, to Azure storage, not blob storage. Be aware, this is just saying, well, we need Azure storage account access and we name it storage. So that's the first thing never used. Then what you do, let me do here, uh, thing then you tell him well you know what i what i really need is i need to pass in the ability to have blob storage access from that storage account i need the blob capability if you will and i will name it blob connection now this string that's very important this blob connection string needs to be the same as it was here in the api project so that it knows which of the connections should i should i get from aspire so that is it. And then what we can say is here at the API service, this thing now needs um, with reference uh, to uh, blobs. So now this is the Aspire way to tell this API service only can run if it has this service here referenced. So now this is like the injection into the project API service. So that's it. The cool thing uh, is that Microsoft prepared also the ability to say, well, if it is ran in development mode, which means if I hit this button here locally on my machine, then use the emulator, which is a locally installed thing uh, called Azureite, by the way. Azureite is a, comes in um, different flavors. The flavor this will use is um, container, which will as soon as you debug, I will show you, it will spin up locally. Azure Write is providing an emulator for Azure storage accounts locally, so you don't have to access the real cloud storage. And then it acts as if it is an Azure storage account, which is really nice for debugging. So with those changes in place, let's now run the application again locally. Or in fact, I think it's the first local run or maybe the second, I cannot remember. So uh, let's see what happens. So let's wait for the dashboard. Remember it was two services in the dashboard, API and web. And now when the dashboard comes up, what you can see is 
that wait just wait a little bit now there is a container for the storage and a new connection and um, it is uh, not having an endpoint so now you can see here that something is running on different ports and with that let's look into the storage explorer this tool you can install to interact with azure storage accounts and let's see there is emulator and this is the emulator attached and if you look down here in this you can see there's something called dev storage account one by the emulator this is azureite so how do i know that this is azureite if i close this and go to my docker desktop now uh, where is it let's open the dashboard i can see that here is this container running and you need to be aware that there's an azureite container i run for local debugging like constantly this is running that's not the container ignore that this is my container here you can see that um, aspire is spinning up this container you can prove that let's just uh, stop the website by just closing it uh, and um, closing this window and as soon as I do this, you can see that the container got deleted. So Azureite, um, while coming up, is taking care of spinning up the container it needs. And that's it. Okay, cool. So that is just working like that. So locally, it's using the emulator, using this Docker image Azureite. And um, so uh, that's it. So let's tweak the UI project a little bit so that we can actually see it later uh, running in the cloud uh, correctly. So I'm going to my web project and in my program class, what I can see is that there is the connection to my API service here and um, all of this is set up correctly. And then I have this weather API client, which now is kind of a dumb name. Let's rename it to just API client because yes, just rename everything. Now it's just an API client and in my weather endpoint, it gets injected as an API client and here I can name it weather API, I don't care. But what I will do, this has now the ability to query the weather forecast, okay, nice. I'm not interested in that. I will add another record, which is the info model, let's say, and it has a string which is called, let me see my um, endpoint again. What was it here? Uh, um, it has a storage account name property, which should be a string. So let's do that. So that is my record. Um, is that enough? Yeah. So that's all I need. It's just a record. Um, and now I can use that here. Let me add another endpoint, public async task of info model this time that's what i just created get info async and i don't need to pass anything in so now i can use this here this is this http client right i can do the same thing so um, re var, um maybe i'm doing this as a nullable because it could be null and then i just can return http client um get uh from JSON async, which is a slash info endpoint. And I will tell them that this should be an info model. Um, is that correct? Slash info and the cancellation token. Yeah, that is because I, um, let me see, get from JSON weather endpoint and cancellation token. Uh, let me put that into this cancellation token cancellation token equals default so now I can pass the cancellation token through and this needs to be awaited because it's async so that way I just added a new uh, HTTP client method which matches the endpoint I created in the API before and with that in place I could go to my home screen here and I can say, you know what? I need now the API client injected. This is Razor. Please inject me the API client and call it API. And now what I can do here in the code section is I could say um, I have this uh, private 
whatever info uh, and this is an info model could be null and then i think it's done in the override which is not the best thing to do but anyways on initialized as and let's say that info equals await uh, api dot no whatever that is api dot get info async and uh, just do it so that way when i do the page uh, initialization he's using the api client i just uh, and calling this method which i just written and now we can say here your you are connected to storage account i don't know strong and this is like the either info question mark storage account name or if that is now we don't know what it is so that way when i now execute this it should give me this on the ui and please be aware i'm not showing you that because i'm saying that is a good way to do that i dislike a lot of stuff there but for the sake of demo it should work now on the ui here when i visit it it should tell me that i have uh oh i uh, did the wrong way it is uh, not the client so i have this let me see what is the thing i need it's not the block client uh, it is let me go over to the microsoft demo so this is aspire storage account there is a nice example here here you can see the tutorial and it's showing all of that i just used it from here and it says blob service client so that is what i need to be so you need to get the blob service client and not the blob client okay let's try again if this works now <clears throat> mm -hmm. let's go here and let's see and he tells us that we are connected to dev storage account one nice so with that stop it it's working locally so and all i need to do in theory is azd up this because this time he needs to do more stuff and uh, because now I have a dependency to a storage account and now what this means is he needs to create this Azure resource for me as a storage account and wire it up. So let me wait until this is I'm coming back when this is done and we look uh, at the result. So it again finished. Um, let's hop over to the web front end to see if it's uh, working. And in fact, it's saying now my storage account is this one it's a randomly generated name let's watch the azure portal and refresh the azure portal and in fact there is now a storage account deployed if you wonder what would happen if we now remove the storage account from this um, from all of that it will not delete it the next time you deploy which is uh, correct so by the way this is what happens if you do a recording during daytime so amazon is ringing and the dog is barking so whatever um so uh it will not get deleted the storage account in azure which is the correct way um it's called differential deployment mode in bicep or in arm which means he will not just delete uh your uh, resources if you no longer use it this is up to you to do that um, which is uh, the correct way okay uh, so with that in place we now have everything deployed by the way if you type in azd down and execute it it will ask you if you really want to destroy all your resources in azure this will take um, some time i think it is totally safe to just delete the resource group uh, in Azure, if, if you have a demo running and you just want to delete it. Um, but uh, the good thing about this is it's working again. So I really like that this is so flawlessly working. What I wanted to do as the last demo here, I wanted to go to my uh, Azure YAML and I wanted to change this from container app to app service. So I'm wondering what happens 
if I'm now decide that I don't want to stick with container apps anymore, now I want to do app service. So let's try ACD up with that. Let's see. And he says, failed to getting services to target container app host at this time. Interesting. So it's not working. Interesting. I didn't know that. So container app works, um, but all the other methods is function working? Probably not. No. So it's just um, a preview. Uh, so all the other options are not working. Only container app is working currently. Interesting. Um, I'm not blaming Microsoft for that. Uh, so probably upcoming is app service and stuff. Uh, it's interesting. Okay, so um, what we don't see here, and we need to have a look at this later. We don't see, if we look carefully, we have one container app running, um, no scaling here involved. So no two container app uh, instances are running to have like a good deployment experience, for instance, that you don't uh, stop your um, service when it gets a new image and stuff like that. There is uh, a weird uh, naming occurring with those uh, randomly generated names, which is logical because if, if you ever uh, looked into how hard it is to name things correctly without interfering with other users' names, like for instance, let's say the container registry here or the storage account, they have to have names which are globally unique because they are resolving in HTTP uh, accessible um, addresses in the web. So this means um, that you need to find a way from Microsoft perspective to not collide with any other users' names. This uh, is one solution to use GUIDs. And um, I always smile a little bit at this because um, I know that if you have a bigger Azure environment with different services running, which is usually what you have, this is no longer an option because now you get error messages um, from services where from the name, you cannot deduce which of my services is it which stage is it so the stage is um, just here in attack that's it um, so it makes like the operating task pretty uh, hard and probable uh, the probable outcome of this is when you have a team running on operate azure that they stick to the microsoft cloud adoption framework let me show what i mean so there is something uh, which my company is doing a lot and um, we are trying to help customers to go uh, over to have a compliant and uh, governance friendly um, Azure environment. And how to do that, it is a kind of claimed here in this cloud adoption framework of Microsoft. So in fact, what this documentation tells you is if you want to run Azure in an enterprise environment, no matter if it's a big enterprise or small enterprise, all those issues you get like uh, how do I plan this? How do I secure this? How do I manage this? All of this is uh, kind of stated in this document. Fun fact is, Microsoft Aspire, current state at least, by default, and we talk about non-default stuff the next time, is directly contradicting whatever is told here. So one thing which is a pillar of this document from Microsoft is that you have to have decent naming conventions in place and they have kind of naming conventions because they have prefixes here um, but first of all um, this is not enough if you ask me uh, to govern your environment and uh, second of all this is like what happens now if several people are running this from different machines kind of the state is not clear here it is kind of a mess currently uh, it's cool for small teams and single users. And let me come to my conclusion for uh, today's talk here. So it is cool that it's working. It's using Bicep in a very um, cool way. It is deploying very cleanly and repetitively uh, to, to Azure. That is nice from a perspective of somebody who starts with that. This again, big warning sign is nothing that you should use in production. The state I showed so far. So next time I'm trying to show 
um, uh, opportunity to tweak your bicep in that case um, and to do it differently than what is proposed here by Microsoft. Let's see if we can have different naming conventions in place and stuff like that. And uh, we will talk about some configuration flaws also in Azure here, um, which from my perspective, and all of this is opinionated, are not uh, what Cloud Adoption Framework tells us to do. With that, I hope this was interesting for you guys, and uh, I'm looking forward for the next time. See you.